or good afternoon or morning or evening or whatever it is where you are um, and a welcome I just wanted to do uh, a couple of really short videos here just to introduce you to a couple of possible approaches or ways to use um, art and imagery in thinking about law and that's what I'm going to be talking about um, over there at UBC virtually um, in another little while but so these are kind of little introductory videos I don't want them to be too long or, or, or too intense just as a kind of a taster for what I'm going to do in a little bit more depth uh, at uh, UBC in another few weeks so uh, a couple of words of, of introduction first uh, my name is Desmond Manderson and I'm a professor in the law faculty and in the arts uh, college uh, here at the Australian National University uh, in Canberra and uh, I've done a lot of work recently on these questions about um, visual arts and law. And uh, as I said, I just want to introduce you to a couple of uh, you know, quick images uh, and um, just as a, as a sort of a way of dipping our feet in the water of what I'm going to be discussing uh, in another few weeks' time. So to do that, I'm going to do the share screen trick um, and take you over to uh, some of these images uh, that I've prepared and I want to start uh, in this image in this uh, short video talking to you about Governor Arthur's proclamation so Governor Arthur's proclamation is an image that was produced by the colonial government in Australia specifically in an area of Australia called Van Diemen's land uh, which is now known as Tasmania uh, in around 1829 to 1830 and it's actually a remarkable image a remarkable statement uh, about the rule of law um, and it's become really an iconic image uh, in Australian uh, history. Uh, here's an example. It was produced on, uh, there are several different versions of it, possibly hundreds were produced, um, but only about seven remain. What are they? Well, they're kind of, um, they're called proclamations. They're kind of, that's probably not the right legal word for them, but they were produced by the Van Diemen's Lands colonial government in order to communicate to Aboriginal people in Tasmania um, what was described as the true intentions uh, of the government. And this uh, uh, image, these set of images, took place in the context of a violent war between Aboriginal people in Tasmania, uh, which is an island off the coast um, of the Australian continent, uh, and white settlers, uh, a violent conflict which had gone on for many years uh, and had killed uh, many people. Um, and uh, uh, so, so the statement here, as you can see, it's, it's really quite remarkable. I've given you a close up on, on the left. Uh, and if you look at this image um, on the right hand side, you can see it's divided into four panels. And those four panels, I think, um, the most kind of uh, logical way of reading them from the, from the top to the bottom, uh, takes you, I think, through a number of different steps in an argument. The top step is a kind of a statement of, a prin of principle, um, a remarkable statement in some ways of the equality of all people. We can think of this as almost a statement uh, about human rights. We've got um, uh, black men and, and, and white men, arms around each other, the same dogs, children holding hands, a white woman with a black baby, a black woman with a white baby. The message seems to be profoundly a question of the equality of, of people. If you could look at the second image, you'll see that um, that equality has changed um, from a sort of generic sameness into a kind of cultural difference. The Aboriginal people uh, have lost their clothes. They've gone back to native dress or, or kind of dress, uh, just as the English people now look like they're um, rulers uh, and soldiers. Uh, and they're meeting on this middle ground. And we can see this almost as if the top panel is a statement about philosophy, the second panel, uh, might be read as a statement about politics. Uh, it's a statement about sovereignty, about the transfer of sovereignty. And we can almost see this handshake in the middle as an accession and an agreement by Aboriginal people to accede to white rule. Now, as I said, the context of this image was that this was not happening, that there was no agreement. There was, in fact, violent conflict between the two groups. Um, so this is a kind of a hypothetical. Why would Aboriginal people agree to the sovereignty of uh, the British colonial powers in Van Diemen's land? And the answer is because of the premises that we've already seen on the, in the top panel, because of the promise of the rule of law, equality, and we might almost say human rights. And then if you look at the last two panels, we see the implications of those promises in the first panel and that agreement in the second panel. 
And that is, as we can see here, an equality under the law. If a black man spears a white man, the black man is hanged by the neutral uh, British rulers. If the white man shoots the black man, the white man is hanged by those same rulers. So there's a kind of statement here, not just about equality under the law, but about judicial neutrality. So an extraordinary statement, um, and one, one could also say a very naive statement, given the actual conditions on the ground in Van Diemen's Land. As I said, a violent conflict, which is now known as the Black Wars in Van Diemen's Land. What makes this image particularly striking is that it took place at exactly the same time. It was produced. Um, why was it produced? Um, well, the, the Governor Arthur was the, was the governor of the time, and he was influenced by his surveyor, um, George Franklin. And George Franklin said, look, we can't communicate with Aboriginal people using words, but I do know that they use bark paintings to communicate with each other through pictures. Why don't we do the same thing? So it was this effort in a way to mimic, almost to mimic um, some aspects of, of Aboriginal art and culture in a certain way, um, and to do it in a way which would transcend the language lines, would use images to communicate cross-culturally. And these images, the idea was that they would be produced, uh, mass produced, maybe 100 images were produced, and then nailed to trees so that Aboriginal people generally could see these images and get the message that um, we, your British rulers, want to live in peace and harmony. We promise you equality under the wall. We promise you judicial neutrality, but don't kill us or we will execute you, and so on. As I said, what makes this image so paradoxical is that at exactly the same time that Governor Arthur was producing this particular image, he, was also, he also declared martial law and tried to corral the Aboriginal population like cattle. He, sp he spread out a whole chain of people across the island and tried to actually herd Aboriginal people onto a peninsula, which was ironically called Point Civilization. That process of herding um, was a complete failure, they, they, it didn't work at all. But it did show a kind of the other side of this story, these promises that were given to Aboriginal people. That is, uh, they were also subject to martial law, they were treated like animals, and they were eventually brought under the control of a kind of, in the custody of, of something which was a bit like a detention centre. And there, uh, not cared for, not looked after, subject to the ravages of disease, without enough food to eat, the Aboriginal population rapidly um, died out. And by uh, 50 years after this image, uh, the last full-blooded Aboriginal Tasmanian uh, uh, Truganini died. So um, the end result of this process in Van Diemen's land in 19th century Australia was genocide. Uh, one of the very few examples of a completed genocide in world history, possibly the only example. So on the one hand, you've got these statements about the rule of law. And on the other hand, you've got this um, violent process of uh, martial law, of exceptional behaviour, um, of herding and corralling Aboriginal people and of leaving them to die. How can, we, um, how can we accommodate both these views at the same time? Is it just the case that the image that we're looking at here is a lie? Or is there something else going on? And so I think, to cut a long story short, um, uh, although many people would say ab about the rule of law that it's a lie, that is that it, 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 you know, we promise equality of treatment, but in fact, as we all know, the rich get one sort of law and the poor get another. It certainly was the case in, Abrig in Australia in the 19th century. Aboriginal people were um, frequently um, gunned down, uh, massacred, um, or executed by the legal system. And the white people that were responsible for those um, destructions, for the taking of their land, and indeed, in many cases for massacre, were never prosecuted, were never convicted under British law, and were never executed. So the, the promise of equality is, is in fact a lie. And this is a, a criticism about the rule of law, which of course resonates not just then, uh, but continues to resonate, resonate uh, in the modern day. But I think that there's something else going on here. And it can be put like this. You can read these images of making a series of statements. Because we are all the same, because you consent to, to our government, therefore, we will give you equality under the rule of law, right? 
but you can read it the other way too. You can read it as uh, a promise deferred. In other words, when you are the same as us, when you dress like us, when you have dogs like us, when you wear the same clothes, when you consent to being governed by us, when you become good subjects of the British crown, then we will give you the rule of law. But until you do, all bets are off. And I think that that temporality, the promise of the rule of law, which is held back until Aboriginal people give in or comply or submit, is a, is, a, is a language of temporality which, again, continues to exist in the present day in relation to Indigenous people, not just in Australia, but all around the world, including, of course, very much in Canada, where, again, we have promises about the rule of law, promises of equal treatment, promises of human rights. But at the same time, there is this, this kind of clause in the background which, which says, but if you are not fit for our sovereignty, if you are not modern enough, um, subservient enough or docile enough, then we must make you civilised. We must make you um, modern. We must force your assimilation. And in that process, the law, rule of law does not apply. Instead, violence, the appropriation of Aboriginal sovereignty, the appropriation of Aboriginal space and, and territory and so on, um, is what we actually see. And in fact, it's the intensity of the beliefs, again, then or now, the intensity of the belief of, of um, the ruling class um, in the values of the rule of law, in the values of British justice or in the values of human rights that actually leads to this violence. It's because we, we believe so much in the promise of the rule of law that Aboriginal people's refusal to submit refusal to comply or refusal to adopt the trappings and the behaviours of modernism enrages colonial powers or post-colonial powers and leads to acts of extreme violence, including indeed the destruction of societies and even, as we see in this case, genocide. So the two parts of the story, the promise of the rule of law on the one hand as exemplified by this image and the violent exceptionalism um, of uh, campaigns against Indigenous people on the other are not contradictions at all. In fact, one implies the other. They go hand in glove. The promises of the rule of law are deferred until Aboriginal people, Indigenous people around the world prove themselves um, uh, ready for it. And until they're ready for it, they must be made ready. And that making ready, that making docile and subservient is an exceptionally violent process. So what started out for me as a kind of paradox, how could they believe in the rule of law while they were trying to herd Aboriginal people onto point civilization and then leave them to die? How could those two things exist together without their brain exploding at the contradiction of it? In fact, turns out not to be a contradiction at all, but actually, the violence of exception is implicit in the promise of the rule of law. And I'll say that again, I like that phrase. The violence of the exception is implicit in the promise of the rule of law. And, um, and uh, if we just go on here, I just want to very briefly point out to you that this image has not only been iconic for um, uh, European stories about the rule of law in the 19th century, it has actually also been an image to which Aboriginal artists have themselves returned over and over again as ways of interrogating the rule of law, as ways of questioning um, uh, the, the, the nature of the rule of law and, and actually using art to prise apart the paradoxes, the tensions, even the hypocrisies within these legal values. Um, so uh, I'm just going to show you here a couple of images. Uh, Julie Goff has done a lot of um, work appropriating these images in different ways. Uh, here is a, a rather well-known work by Gordon Bennett. Um, and if you look for a moment, you'll see why he's called it double take. Uh, itself a kind of a double pun, uh, double take, meaning, you know, like, wait a second, why is it it's, it's the black man that is hanged in both those images? Um, but also uh, double take, I think, is an implication in Bennett's work here that Aboriginal um, land and authority was taken not once but twice. Uh, and then back to Julie Bennett, this I think is a really haunting image. You'll recall um, that that goes back to the um, 
original image here where we've got uh, this image uh, of a white man shooting a black man uh, and then being hanged hypothetically, not in reality. Uh, but if we go back to Julie's image, I think there's something incredibly haunting about the way in which she actually enacts that violence and imagines it actually taking place, not just as an image, but in real life on the colonial frontier over and over again um, in uh, Australia in the 19th century. And here's another image uh, by a modern Aboriginal artist uh, about an actual execution of an Aboriginal man in Tasmania, uh, sorry, in Victoria in 1840. Um, that's itself an interesting story, which I don't have time to deal with here. But if you look at the very image, the very middle of this image, we've got this crowd scene where people are witnessing an execution of an, of an Aboriginal uh, person in 1840 uh, in Ballarat, I think, in Victoria. But if you look in the middle of it, you'll see the figures that are exactly um, uh, copied from Governor Arthur's proclamation, the man and the and the two, the black man and the white man with their arms around each other, the dogs, the children, um, the white man, the white woman with a black baby and the black woman with a white baby, all witnessing um, this violent enactment of so-called British judge, uh, justice. Um, so what we've seen here, I think, is not only what's so suggestive about the original image, but how potent it's been for Aboriginal artists over a long period of time to rework and rethink it and prise apart its contradictions in incredibly powerful ways. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to come back uh, and talk about a different uh, set of images uh, and a different kind of an idea about the relationship between law and art uh, in a few moments.